Okay. Hello, everybody. How's it going? My name is Martin. I work at Urban Zeppelin. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the construction and why um, it's uh, probably the future of crypto UX and probably security too. Let's begin. So let's first define what a kind of traction is. And uh, to better understand this, it's better to speak about uh, smart accounts. You might be familiar with them already. Um, smart accounts are basically smart contracts that behave as accounts. They verify transactions, they hold assets, privileges, roles like owner. Um, they can also call other contacts, which is very important. Some known examples of this is a very popular Gnosis Safe, a multisig, um, Argent Wallet that, that has social recovery, and Instadap. Now, account abstraction is basically a smart account can also pay for its own transactions. That's pretty much it. Uh, what can we do with them? Well, uh, basically, we can have custom validation uh, schemes. This means you can use Ethereum signatures, Bitcoin signatures, whatever signature you want, uh, multi-signature, or any other criteria or uh, logic you want to implement. For example, this is only valid on Wednesdays. Uh, you can implement key rotation in case picture the scenario in which you lose your, you compromise your keys. Instead of migrating all of your assets and roles and whatnot, you simply rotate the keys and you're done. You uh, are safe. Um, we also have guardians, uh, social recovery, which is a very good feature, and session keys. Uh, think of session keys as basically, um, for example, a JSON web token or a set of, pre of uh, permissions you uh, grant, for example, a website, a web application. So you sign once a set of permissions uh, defined by some policy or something, and then that website that can, uh, can um, act on your behalf without you having to sign each transaction every time, uh, which basically gives us Web2 uh, experience on Web3. So how does it look today on StartNet? This is uh, basically the um, interface of an account. We are going to focus on the last four ones, which are execute, validate, validate, declare, and validate, deploy. Uh, we can think of this in a two-step execution flow. First, the validate step. The validate step, uh, you can define uh, arbitrary logic to determine whether a transaction is valid or not. Um, there's, there's a few um, limits in here. For example, you cannot read other contracts uh, storage. This is to prevent spam. Picture the scenario in which uh, there's many transactions that depend on the uh, storage of another contract. That contract changes that storage and then invalidates lots of transactions. That could be a spam, so uh, that's uh, prohibited. Um, so this valid function is used by sequencers to know in advance whether a transaction is valid or not, because uh, instead of an EOA, EOA in which you can only, you simply verify the signature, you can only, you cannot do that uh, as simply in here because you need to execute some code. And this execute step does uh, what you would expect. Finally, since uh, counts are contracts, you need to deploy them and you need to pay for deployments. So how, how do you do this? Well, basically we can do uh, counterfactual deployments, which is you calculate the address of your, of your contract uh, before you send uh, funds to that address that has no contract yet. Then uh, there's this validate deploy function that the protocol uses to validate whether the funds on this address can be used to pay for this transaction or not. And then, uh, basically, you deploy your smart account. Whoa, account of traction. And uh, finally, uh, in StarNet, you can use uh, open sampling contracts for Cairo, in which we have an account, a regular account, which uses the StarNet um, signature scheme. Uh, we have an ETH account, which uses Ethereum signatures, and a, an account library that you can use to build your own custom um, accounts. And I hope that by now you, you got the idea that it means a huge improvement in onboarding, user experience, and security. Oh, Martin, that was fast. We oh, uh, have time. sorry, one last thing. There's a pop-up for this uh, talk. Yeah, you can just ask me right cool. now. Cool. I mean, since this was the last talk, you have the chance to get some okay. questions from the audience. Of course. We still have time. If there's any. Um, so in the Ethereum version of account abstraction, you will have a separate mempool and the boundaries and stuff. So I guess in um, StarkNet, this role will be replaced by the sequencer itself. Uh, I didn't get the last part. Oh, so like in the, so in Ethereum, led uh, in order to execute a abstraction, you need a separate mempool and uh, 
a boundary system. So what would be the equivalent for StockNet? Right, so I mean you mean uh, EIP 4337. That's right. Right, uh, and you're asking about the paymasters? No, we're talking about how, like, is there an alternative mempool that actually relays like better transactions, or how does it happen concretely on StarkNet, uh, the use of account abstraction? Uh, so basically, you send a transaction, uh, and the sequencer picks that transaction, validates this validate function, and um, if it's okay, then it's uh, inserted into the block. I'm not sure I, I got the question right. Ah, uh, so account abstraction is actually built in. Right, sorry. Oh, that was it. Yes, there's native account abstraction on the system. There's no EOAs. So they're completely replaced by them. How do you ensure that in the validation process, um, the validation result will be the same in the actual execution? Um, well, what do you mean, for example? For example, if one uh, transaction depends on the block timestamp, uh, the you, time okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah so uh, that's part of the limitations. So you cannot read any external uh, information from the contract. That includes like blog uh, timestamp, other contract storage. So you cannot use anything that depends on anything else that the very same contract. So does that mean that every wallet address on StarkNet cannot use those functions? No, no, they can, but not on the validate step. They can on the execution step. But the validation step uh, has these constraints to prevent spam. Got it, thanks. Yeah, so, <coughs> thanks for the great talk. <coughs> and one question, could you, you just have a lot of execution code in the validate step and only at the end find out that it's not validate, not, not a valid transaction, and thereby spam those uh, nodes infinitely? Definitely. So, uh, but the, there's uh, smaller chances. Uh, so you, for some other reasons, the, so you could, you're saying that you could invalidate the transaction on the execution part, not the validation No, step. I mean in the validate function. Put a lot of stuff in there, complex stuff, like it takes a long time to compute. Only in the end to There's find There's a out gas limit. Okay, how much is the gas limit for the validate function? Uh, I don't know. Okay, but that's the, okay, that's the solution. Yeah? yeah. All right, thank you so much. This was the end of day one. And thank you.